Uh, welcome everyone. Today we are speaking with uh, Mr. Postel Hermansson uh, from uh, Battery Songur company. Uh, this uh, interview is uh, uh, make it, is is been made uh, with uh, the project in as, as the sign of the project uh, uh, City in Motion, which is uh, made by uh, Institute of Civic Civic Affairs. Uh, Hello, uh, Hermanson. Her Hello, uh, post Postrain. Can you tell us uh, what do you do in, in the battery sangur and, and what's your main interest? Uh, hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me here. Uh, my main interest, I'm a transportation engineer, transportation planner. Uh, and what I do at Petri Samkangur is that I'm the director of development. So I'm in the early development phases of, of projects and policy, mostly in the policy and then planning on, on, on the projects. But, but I know, so, but before that, I was the director of transport and urban design at the city of Reykjavik. Uh, and before that, I was a consultant. So I've been working in the field of, of, of transportation planning and policy in the Reykjavik region for, I guess, more than 15 years now. You have prepared the presentations for us. Yes, yes. I, I, so, yes, we, we, we would love to, to see it. Yeah, and feel free to ask questions. City in Reykjavik. In yeah. Reykjavik. It's yeah. very, very interesting. Okay. So let, us, let us start. So, some of the slides are in Icelandic, but I'll just talk about them though. Uh, yes. So, in the early 60s, we had this plan that we want to be the American freeway city. We really want to be that way. And, and, and there's a phrase there that says, uh, until, uh, I'm, I'm uh, translating, until every grown-up has their own car, we will have to have some sort of public transportation. So that was the vision to build up. Everyone should have their own car and everyone should drive everywhere, sort of. So we're not really... Not public transportation. That was a plan. The, sort of the plan, but they thought, they explained later on that, well, there will be kids and, and the disabled will need the public transportation, but every grown-up grown up people will just drive. drive. Yeah, so it was sort of the vision. But Very American. Very American approach, and, and that was in the 60s and 70s. And... What we saw happening is, is that we saw a lot of sprawl. The, the city expanded a lot in the time between 85 and 2012. The urban area growth was over 100%. The land we took up for new buildings and new uh, population. Population growth was 50%. Population density was shrinking from 55 people per hectare to 35 per hectare. And while 25 the, to 2012, yeah. unbelievable, yeah. So, kind of growth. It, it's, yeah, it happened quite fast and had been happening before that, but it's, it's an area we looked at at some point. And, and we saw uh, growth with sprawl and increased car dependency. And, and we saw that the area in 1985 was like this. This was the populated urban area of the Reykjavik region. It was like... Uh, the gray areas there were where people lived and people worked, but nothing, there were no buildings on the other side. But 25 or, uh, yeah, 25 years later, we had this. Mm. So a lot of sprawl and a lot of car dependency that followed that. And, and, and we were not utilizing the land very well. And then we looked at the sort of constraints that in 2012, we kind of had built everything, we, the, all the land we have, sort of, because you can't really build above 100 meters above sea level, mm -hmm. and you can't build on, on protected areas, and you can't build where you have water resource and, and et cetera. So we sort of like, okay, we're running out of land, kind of. In, uh, but of course, you can always go up to the hills more, but it's not that, it's not that good to go up there. So we're kind of pointing out that for the next 20 years, we need to uh, accommodate 70,000 more pop, uh, inhabitants. And that's kind of the population of all these black areas. So we need to fit this in again. And how is that possible? At the same time, we were looking at how do we travel around? And we found out that the Reykjavik region is quite unique when it comes to car dependency and car travel. Uh, this is the model split in, in the Reykjavik area compared to uh, Nordic cities with 100 to 350,000 people. 
and we were quite unique as you can see the red column uh, around 75 to 6 percent of all trips done by car while you can see in, in Bergen in Norway and in, in Ulu and Tampa in Finland it's less than 50 percent and only four percent by bus two percent by two or three percent by bike and walking was around 15 percent so really unique in that field and everyone else like in those smaller cities we have a totally different uh, mode choice so looking at that we we sat down and all the municipalities made a new regional plan in 2015 based on the analysis we had done and they were then aiming for sustainability and economic efficiency and they were putting in a growth boundary you cannot build on the other side of this line so you have to constrain you can't so to to preserve the land out there they drew up this uh, growth boundary and and uh, looking at integrating uh, urban growth planning and transport policy and that's when the the urban uh, what should we call it transport and development corridors come to play the yellow lines and the dots in there are showing sort of the hot spots of the region and how the high a high quality public transport system called Borkalina will connect those hot spots and the municipalities decided on that growth in the population and jobs will be focused on those regions to get more people to live and work next to these those. are the uh, main transportation corridors yeah and this will be uh, served by the new transportation system. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, like a BRT system, yes. right, from yeah. Curitiba. I see the uh, similarities to the plans from Curitiba in, uh, in uh, Brazil. Okay. So uh, climate is uh, totally different. It is. But the, but the planning system is uh, very, very similar because there, in Curitiba there was also the transportation corridors yeah. uh, served by the uh, BRT systems and uh, people were allowed to build big buildings or uh, just uh, uh, close to these corridors than uh, smaller buildings and smaller and uh, yeah. than, than suburbs so so these are the uh, Curitiba of the north uh, Called Curitiba, you can say, but, but the, the, the plan is, is, uh, it is uh, fascinating, I think. Yeah, so. it, it is a really, uh, I guess, like, it, it's pretty old to, to do it that way, but it works. Yeah. And it's the same if you look at the five finger plan from Copenhagen, where they had trains in every finger and then the population density mm -hmm. the most along those fingers. It's the same in Bergen and, and, and in so many cities are having those same thoughts about mm -hmm. uh, putting the density next to the public transport and, and putting those transport and development corridors through their cities with like the growth yeah. aimed there because we cannot afford uh, putting more land for people and, and having everyone driving around. That's so uh, from, w from which cities the inspiration came? The inspiration, the inspiration for the regional plan, I would say, was from Vancouver in Canada. They've been doing a lot and they're one of the most livable cities in the world. So we're looking, okay, how do the best cities do it? And they've been doing a lot of this work like, okay, uh, urban and, and transport development corridors. Uh, we looked at Stavanger in Nor Norway. It's quite a car dependent city, quite the si similar size. They were doing the similar, same. They have similar problems. Similar, so similar problems. And similar uh, solutions. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we didn't really look at Curitiba, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's so much bigger. But Vancouver again is really big. But we looked at and uh, we looked at some Australian plans as well, and we mm -hmm. kind of looked around the world. How are they dealing with the next phase in population growth? How are we dealing with this century of population growth? So there is the 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 uh, reset for for the problems is known uh, all over the world. It is. It is. We just yeah. my, we just need to take it and uh, to make it in the circumstances that we have yeah yeah i think yeah i think you're absolutely yeah, right no but because in my city there are also the, the problems of car dependence yeah and uh, it is uh, we, we we see that that the solutions are well known yeah. all over the world and, and it's uh, in in my mind it's just a matter of it's uh, it, it's not an, it's just uh, it's just a question of which technology are you going to use to connect the dots. Are you going to use buses? Are you going to yeah. use trains? 
or are you going to use some other vehicles? You just need to move people and goods between those places. Yes. You just you don't have to move cars. <laughs> you have to think. What it depends from? What it is exactly depends from the technology which we use. We we looked at like Bergen in Norway. They have done uh, light rail, and and uh, Aarhus in Denmark has light rail. Both similar sized cities, and Odensee in in Denmark also has light rail, but. Uh, every the politicians kind of agreed that okay we can't afford that we need to have since we are so spread out we need to look at a cheaper solution that is kind of in a way more efficient and and so we looked at like a really high quality BRT system that should uh, in in the basic terms like feel like a light rail you you see you yeah. bus think rail well, that's the phrase so. So that's why we're working with a BRT system, and and also we've never had a train in Iceland. So all the politicians, no, no, we're not gonna aim, we're not gonna go for a train in in the 21st century. We're gonna do something else. I'm like, okay, but but the but the principles are the same, exactly the same. It just yeah. uh, when you come to the stop and, and it's like a platform and and it's level boarding, you go. You enter the vehicle, you've already paid, you can go through all the doors, it's coming every five minutes to the stop. And and it shouldn't matter for the passenger if it's on the track, or if it's a rail, or is yes, it on rubber wheels. So we're trying to make this thing. To, to, to our viewers, what, what is uh, the BRT system about? Uh, do you have a slice? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes, yes I, it's, it's I, I can show you that. Because not everyone know what is BRT. Yeah. And it is some kind of uh, philosophy of, of, of uh, using transportation. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll get to that, okay? Uh, I want to tell you a little bit in, in uh, what happened in the politics is also really important. That uh, the Capital Transport Pact, where we agreed on doing working the municipalities and the state together, was signed in 2019. And these are the Prime Minister, the Ministry of Finance, the Minister of Infrastructure, and all the mayors in the capital area. So it was a huge deal to get them to get the same vision, get on the same page and say, okay, this is our plan. And we learned that from Norway and Sweden, that if you get those main actors together, get to, get them to sort of uh, work, work together on the same policy instead of like, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, all of them now are, are, are concentrating on the same thing and working on uh, uh, investing a lot in, in, uh, in highways, but also in public transport and in lanes for walking and cycling. But uh, main, the main projects are both highways and, and public transport. So we're still investing in highways, but we're, we're doing more and more. We've never done anything like that when it comes to public transport uh, in, in uh, in the capital area here. So and we, I work transport for the capital area. Petr Samkangur is a public company that was uh, invest, incorporated in 2020 to invest in transport infrastructure and we're owned by the government in Iceland and the municipalities in the capital area. And I think that's the key to continue. We're not just from one municipality or not from the state. We're, we're a, a public company incorporated by all of them. And they are all on our board. They are our shareholders. And the vision, interesting solution. I think I think it is quite important once you get there to get the funding and get everyone at the table. So mm -hmm. he's, here are our goals, and I'm not going to go through that a lot. I'm not going to go through that as well. So there's a lot of investment in roads. We have eleven uh, kind of big investment projects, and when it comes to roads, but some of them are connected. Most of them are connected as well to the BRT system planning. But, but this is sort of the, the largest packets of it all. Uh, so now when you build new roads, you, you are thinking at first about BRT planning. Yeah, in a way. In, in this, uh, I, half of the projects are, are, are connected to the BRT system, I guess, but half of the projects are not. So they were like planned earlier okay. on. But half of the projects are like okay, directly connected to the BRT system. Uh, we have a huge packet as well as of bike path, uh, a bike path, net path network that will be financed by this packet, this agreement between the state and the municipalities. And that's again a huge step for us because the some of the municipalities were doing a lot, the city was doing a lot, some of the other municipalities were doing some, the state was giving the municipalities some money to do it, but we never had sort of the 
the common vision of where do we make those, I guess, bicycle highways or the main connections for bicycles between the key areas. So we're, so we're, when we're going to do the, the system of the bicycle highways here. It's not really bicycle highways, but it's, it's uh, it, we used to have like, it's uh, a separated bike path. It's a real bike path. You don't have to bike yeah. on the street or on the, on, or on the sidewalk. Uh, you're biking on your own bike, uh, bike lane. And again, this is really connected to the BRT system because along the BRT system, we're going to build bike lanes as well. So it's all connected, the, the, the roads, the BRT system and the bike yeah. paths, it's all connected. So we're kind of creating, I guess, three alternatives, three different infrastructure projects to connect everyone in the area. I think that can go together because in this uh, low density, you get low density here. And if uh, uh, people live in the... Um, homes uh, which is uh, far from the station mm -hmm. they can just use bike yeah yeah so we can go to the bike and uh, ride the bike as long as you want then get the bus yeah yeah so, so the system goes together all the system goes together yeah you can integrate that and and, and we try when we when we go into construction or any project, we always try to do bicycle path as well so we're always thinking okay how do we provide infrastructure for everyone and our BRT system, Borgalina, this is sort of a, a one slide explanation. So this is a high quality bus rapid or BRT transit, bus rapid transit system, BRT system. Uh, we call it third generation BRT for the Reykjavik capital area. Uh, you can see in, uh, in the map, the network of routes that will be operated by the Borgalina routes. And, and you can see that uh, the routes will drive sort of in, in dedicated lanes, as you can see on here. Here you have the red dedicated lanes next to the station or the platform. And, and we will have dedicated lanes most of the time where you have like the full lines. Where you have the dotted lines, the buses will continue there without having dedicated lanes. They drive just on the regular street. So that's we call, why we call it the third generation. It's because it's not like a train that needs the track needs to stop at the end of the track, it's the bus that can continue on the street and, and that's why they can provide better service and that's why they're more flexible. But it's really important to invest in the dedicated lanes in the urban core and everywhere, everywhere. but you don't have to invest in the dedicated lanes where there's no traffic delay or anything when you're out in the suburbs or more sprawled communities. Yes, in the suburbs. So, so that's like, uh, that's, the, the, that's how I, why I like BRT more than, than light rail in that sense because it has the flexibility of providing service far, further out and providing more people with service instead of just building one corridor of 15 kilometers of light rail you can build 35 kilometers of BRT and connect it to a lot of other neighborhoods but other than that I like light rail so, so, so <laughs> yeah. is there some so let's sum up this is what this is it is about that uh, you uh, this is the buses which uh, works like a light rail, so that they are, uh, they have separated lines. Uh, they have uh, the stations uh, b because we can call it even the, the station that yeah. that people are uh, paying for driving before they enter. Yeah. Uh, so they are not uh, not paying uh, to the driver right now. The yeah. buses, uh, the people in the buses are paying to the driver. Yeah. Yes, so I think it slows down the system, so yeah. it will be faster. faster. Yeah. So, so you, can fast. see, you can see like a BRT vehicle there, it's 24 meter long with, with uh, three entrances and you can go in everywhere. And the platform is like this, you can, it, it's, it's a raised platform so you can walk directly on board. And uh, you yeah. so, so accessibility for everyone uh -huh. should be really accessible. And the stations, you have real time information here, you can pay for the ride before you go on the bus. You can park your bike here, so it's it's sort of like it's it's a like a rail station, a light rail station, 
but we're using a bus. So bike parking in every station of BRT. Yeah. It's very important. It's in every station. It is. So you have this first mile and last mile problem. You can always go to the next station and you can think, okay, should I bike today or should I bike just to the station and take the bus? Yes, if that starts raining, you just get the bus. Yeah, yeah. Great. And are there some local lines, local bus lines that uh, are connecting these uh, main stations to uh, the neighborhood? Yes, you can see uh, it in you can see on the map. It's like in light gray. There are like uh, just the regular bus lines there. Okay, so, so integrated so, with the regular bus yeah. lines. So in the station, you can get the regular bus lines and. And yeah, you know, to your, to your destination. and that's again uh, one of the benefits of having a BRT is that you can the regular buses can use the stations as well if we if we want to, and though they can also drive in the dedicated lanes. So I, I think that's also important. So you can have bus routes going from some uh, suburb, you tr driving on the dedicated lanes for maybe 500 meters, and then it's off again to a different location. So. So every bus can use the dedicated lanes. And also it's important for uh, emergency vehicles, in our opinion. And that's another big thing because uh, once you have a traffic congested city, it's really tough for ambulances and, and police cars and, and, uh, and uh, fire trucks to get around. They can use these special lines. They can yeah. use those special lines to get... Yeah, see, we all use, we, we use uh, yeah. the special lines. Uh, yes. and. The, the very important question, will it be the light, uh, the green wave from the bicycle, so for, from, the, from the buses, for the buses, uh, so the buses of BRT will, uh, will not be able to, will, will not have to uh, stand on the red light, yep. they will just drive on the, yep. on the, uh, on the um, green light. Yeah, so it's it's signalized right of way, so they will have like, we have already put in place uh, a st system called Stream, where you have like uh, communication between the bus and the the signal traffic signal. Okay. So the traffic signal knows that the bus is coming, and when we have Borgalina, it should be even better. So it's a priority for them, and everyone else will get a red light, and the bus will go through so as fast as possible. There is this kind of system. So right now, the, the buses are getting uh, can get bus can get uh, the green lights, especially for him. Uh, in in a way, but, but we we haven't okay. we haven't uh, done a little bit of that. But but we yes. want to do more, and we will do more once we have the Borcalina vehicles and everything up and running. Then we can okay. have do more of that. So now we are starting to use this uh, this system of uh, of uh, green wave. Yeah. And then it, when the Borcalina will start, it will be the total green wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will try to work on that that and and yeah. Yes, yeah. And also what this means is that. I say here it's uh, 18 or 24 meter long buses every 7.5 minutes, mostly on dedicated bus lines. And, and the frequency of the buses, that's the main thing. That's a huge, has a huge impact on the travelers. If you have to wait, if you miss the bus and you have to wait 15 minutes, you're like, okay, this is not an option for me. I'm just going to take the car. I'm just going to buy a car next week. Yeah. But once you're down below 10 minutes, you stop looking at the timetable, you just go to the station because you know the next bus is coming that quite, you might, it might be there when you come and it's not that far away if you just miss it. So it, it's, uh, um, I don't know, it's a psychology thing that you have to think about. Once you get down below 10 minutes, people are like, okay, I don't have to look at the timetable, I'll just walk to the station. Okay. And, and, and again, what we want to do there... If you are from the communication company from Wood, just stop uh, uh, watching this video, turn back and listen to this once more. <laughs> and then once more, and then once more. And uh, after 10 times, you can uh, listen to the video uh, <laughs> next. <laughs> okay. And, and this was very important. And that's the thing with uh, Borkalina and the bus system. Today, uh, I think we have, these are the areas served with a uh, frequency of 10 minutes or more. Uh, showed in, in the dots. But once we have the Borcalina and the bus, new bus route system in place, 64% of the residents in the capital area will have that accessibility to really good bus service. 
So it will change a lot. We have less than 20% today, have a really good bus service if we, if we define it like that. But that's the thing, we will build the infrastructure and we need to provide the service. The infrastructure is not going to do anything by itself. The, the bus yes. needs to be up and running. That's right. That's <laughs> every seven point five minutes. So that's another thing. We we I don't know. We've been had some complications with because we have, we got a big problem with it in, in our city. So that's why I said that they should uh, watch this again and again and again. Yeah. Yes, the infrastructure are, are made, but uh, the uh, buses or trams are not coming. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just yeah. uh, you go to the station and buses are not coming. So. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. So I, I think that's key and you have to think about it and, and plan it both at the same time. Once you, when you want to finance new infrastructure, you have to think about how we're going to finance the operation. How are we going to run the buses in the future? How are we going to do it? And what's the service level, etc. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you have to think so many other things. And I have a couple of more slides if we have time. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, because I've, what I've been discussing a lot is, is what we did here, at least, is the, the question we were asking was, how many cars can we move down the street? That was sort of the main question. That was the task for traffic engineers and transportation engineers. Yeah. But the question this century is how many people can we move down the street? And we have to think of us as, as people movers, not car movers. And we're planning the city and we're planning regions for people. We're not planning them for cars. And, and, and it, it, it's quite a simplified view, but you can say that when you're in rural areas, you need to move vehicles. People will need vehicles to get around and they have long distances. But in urban mobility, in my opinion, is you have to move people and you have to move stuff. You don't have to move vehicles. You, you have to think out of the vehicle and, and you should think like, okay, I don't mind what kind of vehicle you're gonna use. We just need to move people and stuff around. And the same thing when you have urban mobility, you have to think about all these things at the same time. It, it wasn't that complicated back in the day when you were just like, okay, everyone should have a car. We just built a road and another road and a bigger parking lot. Oh, we need a bigger parking lot. Oh, we need another parking lot. Yeah. And then, oh, we need to widen the road. More and more money and yeah. space. Yeah. And more and more and more. And, and, and then we now think about, okay, uh, travel time, capacity, safety, efficiency. You need to think space on the move. How much space in the city is the vehicle taking up? And how much space is it taking in the storage? Every car that is sitting like 95% of its lifetime, it's taking out a lot of space of our cities. And do we want that? How much space are we willing to give away for that? Is it 50% of the city? Is it 20? Is it 80? We need to decide that and we need to plan accordingly. But now also we have emissions and air quality and public health all these issues that we didn't have 50 years ago. No one thought about uh, CO2 or air quality or public health, I guess. When it came to transportation, we were just so happy to have cars. We were like, woohoo, this is going to be great. No one thought we would have like traffic noise. That was like, no one thought about that. Yes. And, and, and no one thought like about the public health thing of, of just sitting in your car and driving instead of walking and the impact on, on obesity and public health it has. It, it has a lot. And also the operational cost for, the, for people. It's one thing you, you have to build infrastructure, you have to operate the buses, you have to plow the snow, you have to pave it again and again. But how much, much does it cost for every individual to own a car and operate a car versus just taking their bike or use, and using the money for something else? Because for an economy like Iceland, importing all those vehicles and all those, uh, all these fuels and, and, and everything, it's, it's not good. It's obviously not good for a, for a community like us to, to import all of that to Iceland. We don't produce cars or, 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 or uh, fossil fuels or anything. So, yeah. And, but Interesting point of view, yes, because we don't produce cars, we don't produce fossil fuels, it's a problem. Yeah. It is, yeah, but I think it might be different in the US where they produce cars and fossil fuels, though, it's, though they have to think in their economy, okay, we're protecting the jobs of people who work in those sectors, mm -hmm. it's the same in Germany, they have a huge car industry, 
uh, and, and some places in Europe as well. Sweden, Gothenburg is like the Detroit of the North. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting to think, think about that for the local economy. How, what's your um, choice? And again, we've been, I find it really disc interesting that we, we like cars so much. We try to reinvention them again and again and again. We love them so much. We're always like, okay, this is the vehicle we're going to use. And we just have to change it a little bit. Okay, we're just going to have Teslas and tunnels driving around, but it's still, it's a private car. It's the same idea as in 1913 or, or early 1900s. Mm -hmm. Or a self-driving car where you sit in the back. And you're like, okay, but still the same vehicle. Or the Tesla truck or yeah, automated vehicles where you can have a meeting on your way. It's always the same vehicle. We're like kind of stuck with that. And I l love this slide. It's about the structural waste in the mobility system. Uh, because typical European car is parked 90% of the time. And it's only moving 8% of the time. And the average European car has five seats but carries 1.5 people per trip. Is that a good vehicle for us? Is that a good solution for us? 5% uh, of the time of its lifetime it's driving. That's all. 95% of the time it's not serving you uh, as people mover. And uh, the energy used to move people, 86% of the fuel in an uh, in internal combustion engine never reaches the wheels. So you're like, okay, is that a good invention? And also when you look at uh, but death, um, deaths and road injuries, that's a lot. So we're kind of stuck with that. Like, okay, we love the idea of a car, but still it has a lot of problems. And we kind of, ignored them until recently in my opinion and we need to sort of tackle that in this century as fast as we can and also we can say i also love this slide you can solve uh, the co2 emissions and you can say okay we move from this average victorian car uh, to dual occupancy cars we now have evs but still it takes up 10 square meters of our city so, would, uh, so this is the space and this is uh, the CO2. You can say, okay, we solved the CO2, I now have an electric car. Okay, we're all set. No, we're not. Because we still take up all the space in the city, per occupant. And again, how much space do we want to uh, give to the car and private vehicles? And, and I love this picture as well because most of the cities are like 50% of the area is, is consumed by parking, streets, service stations, driveways, signals, and traffic signs. So if this was your apartment, you, would, you wouldn't like that apartment. 50% of it was just a garage, and then you'd have some rooms around it. So that's sort of like, you might say the car-centric city is planned like that, and no one would buy, I don't know anyone who would buy that apartment who want to live in that apartment. It's also about the money, because you would you should pay for all the apartment and only live in this uh, small uh, rooms. Yeah, yeah. And also, this, this is about the money of the of uh, the community also. We pay taxes, yeah. but uh, the most of the taxes will go to, for the roads, for, for the parking spaces, mm. not for the spaces which is really good for us, that then we can spend the time uh, and build our health, our good lifestyle yeah. in these places, but also mm. in this. So we are living in a big garage. <laughs> we, we kind of live, yeah. If, if, if this is your city, you're living in a big garage, with some rooms around it. Yes. And, and if I, I, that's why I find this really fascinating. And, and you have to ask yourself as a policymaker, do you want to sort of, sort of reserve 50% of your city for vehicles, for, for this kind of vehicle, or do you want to do something different? Do you want to reserve maybe 30%? And what else can you do then for those 70% for people, not for the cars? So again, I, I, I think, I think we're going in the right direction. I think we're moving ahead yeah, on, and yeah. we're trying to take reasonable steps, but it's taking a lot of time and it's gonna has been taking a lot of time and it will take a lot of time. And again, if I, to, just to finish up, if I go, because urban mobility is so complicated. These, all these variables, we have to think of all of these variables at the same time. And a lot of people say, no, just think about the capital cost. Just think about the air quality, you know, no, we have to think about all of it at the same time. 
and and it's getting more complicated every day. <laughs> it was the interview with uh, Mr. Uh, Poston Hermason, the man who uh, should think uh, who, who thinks about all these things. <laughs> so uh, it was very very interesting interview. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Great. I had a great time.